So we had a tremendous opening conversation this morning about the federal and state issues that lie before us, particularly in light of the expansion of distributed energy resources. We now have a panel that can dig in a little bit deeper and talk specifically about what that interface between the transmission and distribution system looks like. Dave Olson of our board has agreed to moderate this panel. I'll let him introduce and conduct the discussion, but it should be a really great conversation on one of the most important and emerging issues that's facing our industry. So David, to you, Dave Olson. Thank you, Tom. The, the dynamics driving decentralization are certainly in motion across the country and around the world. So we thought it would be useful to assemble leaders representing a range of experience and perspective. Um, we can sure learn from what other states and countries are doing, and as we have an excellent group to help us think about these issues today. Uh, you can see from their bios in the program that we have uh, a really distinguished group of people here. Uh, Dwigi Mickey, uh, the head of strategy and development for, for Turna, the uh, Italy's transmission system operator. Luigi was a star at our symposium last year, and we're really grateful that uh, he agreed to come back and share Italy's uh, extensive experience with dis distributed energy resources. Lorraine uh, Kiba, from uh, Commissioner of the Hawaii uh, Public Utilities Commission, represents an island grid with inspirational clean energy goals and uh, deep penetration of DER. Ron Nichols, president of Southern California Edison, will give us a California utility perspective. Lorenzo Christoph, a principal in the ISO's Market and Policy Infrastructure Group, will give us a transmission system operator perspective. And for a non-utility DER provider perspective, former FERC chair, uh, John Wellinghoff, who's now chief policy officer at Solar City. So each um, is going to give a, a brief outline of their situation, and then we're gonna discuss um, some of the key issues that um, are important not only for each organization but for state and national practices and policy as well. It's something that we as a group have been able to talk about a little bit, so we have lots of questions for each other. I hope we'll drive the discussion. Signor Miki, andiamo. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> Please. Okay, um, thank you very much. I'm very flattered to be here and be invited here uh, with such a distinguished audience. Um, as David was saying, it's second time for me and every time I usually uh, pops up with uh, some different things and concerns. And then, but this time, I, I, to be honest with you, I have more positive news than concerns. And this is a positive news now. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, the decentralization is something uh, we have not only to accept, but to, uh, to, to work in favor of. And effectively, uh, let's, in order to set the proper frame, frame in which some key points must be highlighted, let me uh, talk about two pillars. One, uh, the uh, climate change goals of Europe. Of course, we have to achieve a certain level of renewables, no matter what. And this is the goal, and uh, renewables are uh, currently, uh, have been currently sprawling all over Europe, uh, and particularly in Italy, where we now have uh, 40,000 uh, gigawatt of renewables, uh, 20,000 gigawatt of intermittent renewables, I would say, uh, 20,000 uh, 20, sorry of solar, 1,000 of uh, wind plus the biomass and others. So this obviously uh, creates a lot of troubles for uh, the ATSO, but as we were discussing, uh, positively discussing inside in our RGI group, we had, we had a inter very interesting discussion about this. It's time to talk about opportunities more than about concerns and troubles and flipping the, child, flipping the cards. And this is absolutely true. And this is one of the most important points I would like to do uh, today. So uh, in order to do that, in order to transform troubles in uh, opportunities, and it's important to have the chance 
from the TSO standpoint to untap this, uh, the potential of these resources to extract an enormous amount of value from the distributed resources. And so uh, there are some keywords to be, and we can get back to them <clears throat> during this conversation. And these words are flexibility on one side, but more important, visibility on the other. We can't uh, afford a, 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 an old, uh, old-fashioned hierarchical uh, system. We must have a system able to enhance as much as, possible, um, as much as possible the potentiality of these resources, and visibility is key in this in this uh, way. And, and we'll certainly talk about both of those: visibility and flexibility, as we come back. Lorraine. Yes. Thank you, David. Aloha, everybody. Um, as you know, um, we uh, in Hawaii are, uh, as I always say, sending postcards from the future, if not to the rest of the country, but to the world. And it's great to be here on the panel with all these um, distinguished speakers. By way of background, just for you that don't um, maybe know or, or aren't familiar, um, Hawaii is recognized, um, along with many other states that have been at the forefront. And in 2014, I know California PUC, and you just heard from President Picker, you know, the way with some energy storage orders that really created the market so that energy storage as a distributed energy resource could, could take off and the technology innovations could occur. Uh, Chair Audrey Zebelman in New York was uh, in the, you know, initiating the New York Rev proceedings to really look at how distributed energy resources and, and that whole structure there. And ourselves in Hawaii, uh, you know, none of this being coordinated but just happening simultaneously. Uh, in April of 2014, we issued four seminal orders, uh, one of which uh, address the uh, integrated resource plan that the uh, uh, utility, one of the main utilities, the Wine Electric companies had submitted for us. And, and as part of that uh, order process, we issued the inclinations on, um, to give guidance and a roadmap to all of Hawaii's utilities, not just Hawaiian Electric, on uh, the Hawaii's utilities of the future and the roadmap for Hawaii to uh, truly achieve um, the, the clean energy economy and the renewable energy vision that had been set forth in the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative as of that date. And right now, we're in the process of, of proceeding in, into Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative 2.0. As all of you know, or should know from following the press on us, our, our legislature the, uh, the, the past year uh, adopted a 100% renewable portfolio standard. So Steve, uh, you know, uh, Cal, uh, Cal Iso, uh, you know, definitely is part of the, the collaborative process here in California, along with all the stakeholders that are here and at CPUC to, to achieve your 50% goal. But we are well on our way to achieving a 100% goal by 2045. And we're among the states that have the most aggressive goals uh, for, for renewable portfolio standards for electric industry. We had a 70% goal uh, before we got the 100% goal, which was 70% by, by, by uh, 2050. And now it's 100% by 2045. So we have a task at hand, um, but I am encouraged and we are, uh, we are definitely up to uh, the, the challenges that come with that. And I think that's why we are leading. As you all know from following the statistics on Hawaii. We lead the country, if not the world, in terms of, I think, integration of renewables on very unique grids. We've got um, six separate island grids. So quite frankly, we don't have an energy imbalance market. I wish we, we did, in fact, so, so we wouldn't have to deal with some of the other issues that we deal with. But we are energy ecosystems in each of those six island grids. And we must uh, solve the issues and address the challenges and, and innovate and use the technology on those island grids and, and there comes the opportunity and also what I would encourage all of you stakeholders out there to really consider Hawaii as the, the, the beta test site, the living laboratory and because our island grids are small I think we have a lot of flexibility to, to be able to try things, to pilot things, to use the technology uh, you know it's, it's a small island grid I mean the, the issues are still the same, the electrons are the same but I think there's a little bit more opportunity that we're not taking the whole you know western region down when we do try something on, on, on a part of our island Island grid. So I invite uh, uh, the stakeholders out there and other ut sister utilities. Actually, if you want to pilot something, please partner with us so that we can we can demonstrate. And we've also um, done that already with uh, some of our projects, Jump Smart My, which has international partners from Nido, Hitachi, 
EPRI, uh, NREL, to, to demonstrate the integrated grid of the future and to use DERs you know, at the transmission level and what basically is happening from customers at the distribution level. And I think that's one thing we need to remember is the customers are an important part of this. Uh, and they are the key to what we are doing in Hawaii. Uh, customers have choices. We want to enable and empower them to be part of the grid. And customer-sided resources in Hawaii are being part of the solution. And therefore, when we issued our guidance in 2014, we basically clearly outlined the regulatory uh, framework so we could provide certainty, because that's what regulators need to do so that the market can develop and respond and, and the industry and, and stakeholders can appropriately design the market and we can incentivize the right market uh, signals. So in Hawaii, we clearly defined energy efficiency, demand response, and energy storage as distributed energy resources. And energy storage includes all types of energy storage. It includes electric vehicles, it could be customer-sided energy storage, as well as you know, hydro and, and, and battery storage that you know, all of you are familiar with being in this jurisdiction. So that was an important part because we said that you must use these DERs in your resource planning, they are part of the generation toolkit to be used, and thereby the impl implication that DERs uh, that we've identified would also be subject to, to cost recovery. So right now, as we proceed to go forward, we are in HCI 2.0, and I, I want to leave you with what we are, are guided by, which is the four R's, renewable energy on a reliable grid within a reasonable time frame and at reasonable rates, because we can't forget, I think, the themes that we talked about yesterday, affordability, as we address issues of climate change and, and move forward in the clean energy economy. That's terrific. And when we get into the discussion, I hope you'll explain in, in a little, with a little more specificity exactly how you're using distributed energy resources on a, in a 100% renewable grid. Ron. Dave, thank you. Now, I, had a, I was speaking at a a seminar that was kind of a similar topic to this a few weeks ago in the same general location. And I had to start off with the same sort of comment that I'm going to make here now. But I successfully, according to my attorneys at the last time, was able to discuss many of the topics that we're talking about here today. And I never strayed inappropriately into open proceedings that we have before the commission. And I intend to not stray into that today. So I just want to make you aware we do have a number of open proceedings on issues related to distributed energy resources and the like at, at the commission, and uh, I, I don't intend to talk about them. If I have to cut comments short with respect to that, hope you'll appreciate doing that, but I, I, don't, I don't anticipate any need for any commissioners to have to walk out of the room with regard to this conversation. You know, I think Edison has, has been recognized as being uh, very strongly embracing the, the growth of distributed energy resources uh, on, on our system. And there's a lot of discussion about the future of DERs and tomorrow and what happens. The, the future of distributed energy resources is here today. We're dealing with it in an extraordinarily large way. Um, perhaps maybe not the same percentage as some of the things that, Lorraine, that, that Hawaii has dealt with, but in scale, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And when we look at what we're trying to deal with, there's just a number of questions that we, that, we, that we have to work our way through to get this to work right. Because one of the things that I believe, while we have a lot of comparisons between New York and, and California, we're very, very different. There's very different things that are driving um, those, those different uh, regulatory changes and structures for distributed energy resources um, between, between the two states. So the really questions are simply how much faster then we're already seeing DERs grow. Are we likely to see? What's that pace going to be? Um, what, are, what are going to be the, uh, the compensation models associated with that? Um, what, are, what type of transactions are we going to deal with? Uh, how do we allocate the cost with respect to that? And how do we provide the data and the information necessary to be able to, to make this grow? Now, those all seem like, you know, perhaps a few thorny issues to deal with, and, and they are. But we are dealing with those. The commission, I think, has done in the state here has done a really great job of laying out a lot of workshops. I mean, all of us, many of us in the room spend, and our staff spend a lot of time 
working through some of those very thorny issues on that. But we, we don't have to solve every single one of these issues today. You know, we have a lot of growth we have in, in, in the market. Uh, it's a robust market today. It'll be even more so as we move forward. We have an opportunity, I think, that California, and maybe a little too parochial, maybe a little too proud of what California does, but I think we have a really great opportunity to get it right and to be an example to certainly the rest of the nation. Um, system's a little bit different than, than it might be in, in Europe and in, in Italy, Luigi, and I'd be interested in talking a little bit more with you about that. But as we work through establishing better, what is the value of DERs to the distribution system? How do we get that to work out? How do we work through, Lorenzo, on the issues between providing an opportunity for DERs to play in the wholesale market while we still meet the requirements for distribution reliability at the same time? And I know we'll talk a little bit more, uh, more about that. How do we make sure we have an adequately ready grid for that at the distribution level? And what do we need to do? How quickly does that have to happen as we ramp up uh, an even greater level of penetration, which is what we want to achieve. Where all of this is about, and very similar to what Lorraine was talking about, our goals here are the same. We're looking to drive down uh, GHG emissions. We want to create opportunities. Our customers, not all of them, our customers want opportunities for taking more control over, over their use of e energy, their opportunities for how they source their, 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 their supplies. We want to provide the choices to those that want it, we want to have a, a, an affordable system that works for those who don't. And to meet, to meet both of those requirements is something that's, that's really important for us. But when we look through what we, what the huge changes that we made almost two decades ago now on, on the transmission and the wholesale side, it's a very more dynamic situation when you start dealing with the transmission, excuse me, the distribution system. Edison makes like last year, I think we made something north of 22,000 short-term and longer-term configuration changes in our distribution system to maintain reliability, to deal with outages, to deal with customer changes, to deal with, with fires and storm requirements, to be able to work things around to maintain better reliability on our distribution system and on a real-time basis. 22,000, you don't make 22,000 changes to to the, uh, the ISO transmission uh, uh, s system that, that serves us, or even, frankly, across the WEC in, in total. We have to be able to find a way that acknowledges that complexity and still provides opportunities for distributed energy resources to, to provide value to the grid, provide value to the customers, and to reduce GHG redu uh, emissions to be able to have an opportunity to play in the wholesale market. We think we can get this right. We're excited about working our way through on this and to create some examples as we go forward. There's a lot of, lot of uh, demonstration projects that both the commission has proposed and various of the utilities have proposed on top of that. Let's, let's get those working forward and let's, and, and let's learn as quickly as we can um, before we go completely hog wild on, on opening up everything. And I think there's a great opportunity going forward and happy to talk about it more. And we will. Lorenzo. Okay, thank you. Um, just to pick up for a moment on something Ron just said about the 22,000 changes in configuration. Uh, since I've been talking a lot to the distribution side folks at the utilities over the past year, I've come to appreciate the term normal abnormalities that they're operating under abnormal conditions as a normal state of affairs because everything is changing on a daily and maybe even hour to hour basis. Transmission distribution interface sounds like a very technical topic and indeed it is, but it's one of those reverse funnels where you enter through this narrow passageway that's TD interface with all its technical details, but it actually then opens up onto the entire industry and how it works and how it operates. And that's been kind of an amazing uh, thing to experience. I got started in this area about four years ago when I led an initiative at the ISO to expand the capabilities for distributed resources to be participating in the ISO market. And I started projecting that forward and thinking, all right, we're having now a couple of dozen, maybe 
40, 50 uh, DGs that are participating as resource adequacy resources, project this out, in five to 10 years, we could have 100,000 tiny resources in the ISO's market optimization, which is our five minute optimization market. Is that really a good place to be? Is that a good way to manage a market that has 100,000 tiny resources? And my answer at that point was simply, well, maybe, but maybe not. Let's think about a lot of possible alternatives. So as I got into that question, um, then it became very clear that the expansion of DER means new ways of operating for distribution companies, for sure, and new ways of thinking about the transmission distribution interface. What's happening between the ISO and between the distribution companies as DER expands? And it's, all, it's important in that regard to realize that there's two different dimensions of DER we need to talk about. One of them, I think, is where most people go is rooftop solar and these things that are being installed by customers because they want certain services from them or they want to have a certain environmental uh, impact and reduce their, their impacts. Um, but those things, those devices are behaving really primarily to serve what customers want and may have no interest in, in the market and certainly no interest in what their impact is on the ISO. Then there's that whole other category which is now going to be growing a lot faster which is resources that do want to participate in the ISO market. So you have problems coming from two, dimensional, two dimensions. The diversity of resources that are simply out there we'll call autonomous because customers adopt them and they do things with them and that has an impact flowing up to the ISO grid. And then there's the question of resources that are in the market where the ISO dispatches them and they're trying to respond and the distribution company has no visibility to that transaction. They don't see that market transaction today. So we really need to think about both aspects of this and in the course of thinking about different ways to organize that, now the phrase DSO, distribution system operator, has entered the common lexicon of the industry. Everybody talks about DSOs, but frankly, there is no one definition of what that is. There's a huge range of possibilities, and that's what makes a lot of this conversation uh, very exciting, that you could go all the way from at one extreme a DSO that looks pretty much like today's distribution company with some enhanced capabilities for planning and for operations and visibility that help enable integrating large volumes of DEOs, uh, DERs. But then you could go to a very opposite extreme where the DSO really takes on a huge uh, portfolio of responsibilities around operations, around markets, around coordination, even supply demand balancing to almost where you have something that looks like a neighboring balancing authority with imports and exports across the T and D interface. And there's a whole range, a whole spectrum of possibilities in between those. So it's really, uh, TD interface to me represents a range of possibilities for which we've not really any idea yet what's the best way to go. It's all an exploration and everybody who's working in this area I think shares in that excitement of possibilities. John, I know you've thought a lot about this for several years. For a couple of years, Dave. And, and Dave, I, wa I want to thank you and I want to thank President Burbridge for having me here in this, this fantastic conference. Every year I come and I see more and more people. In fact, I was, I was talking to Steve last night at dinner and saying, you know, he's going to have to uh, next year rent out the Moscone Center to get everybody here. You, know, you can't, can't, uh, can't accommodate people who want to come to this because of how, how good this conference is. It really is fantastic. So, um, you know, when I come to this, I really uh, I come to this issue of distributed resources and integration, I really do come from the consumer perspective. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, Lorraine took you to the future. I'm going to talk a little bit about the past and then talk about, about some about the future. But to give you a little bit of a pers perspective from a consumer perspective and a different perspective from the numbers that you've heard <clears throat> already uh, today uh, that California, I guess, has about uh, 5,000 megawatts of distributed resources and on its way soon to 10,000 megawatts of distributed resources. I just got cleared from our legal department at Solar City that I can say that, you know, we're putting in, in California, uh, 100 power plants a day, meaning we're putting in 100 installations of rooftop solar a day in California. So, 
uh, imagine what the implications of that are with respect to the issue of those distributed resources and how those distributed resources have potential for utilization. Uh, and Lorenzo, I, I think those resources you talked about, somewhat passive resources, but I think there's a potential in the future for them to actually be active resources. But let me take you back to the past first. Let me take you back to when I went to FERC back in 2006 and I really didn't even know what an ISO was and I learned a lot about ISOs over my seven years at FERC and what their potential is and now I have more than a great respect for them. I think they're, they're a great institution that in fact have saved consumers in this country, including the Cal ISO, literally billions of dollars by the efficiencies that they drive uh, uh, into the system through their, their market rules and their market tariffs. And so with respect to the integration of distributed resources, I think we can look at another ISO, and, and not in any way to be negative to the Cal ISO, but one that had experience just because of the structure that it had, which was different from the structure that the Cal ISO had. And one, I think, good thing about FERC in the, in the creation of ISOs, it allowed those ISOs to have different structures and different rules, market rules. Uh, for example, PGM has a capacity market. You don't have a capacity market here in California. Um, and so with that capacity market, what grew out of PGM, which for those of you who may not know, I'm sure most of you do, you know, it, it is one of the largest markets in the world, uh, encompassing states all the way from New Jersey to Illinois. And uh, in that market, of uh, over 150 gigawatts total, uh, they were able to develop the integration of distributed resources of 10 gigawatts of demand response. And that 10 dig gigawatts of demand response over a period of years, and again, while I was at FERC up through you know, 2013, they ultimately utilized that resource for capacity and for energy, and in some instances for ancillary services, and integrated really very efficiently under their market rules that they developed uh, during that, that period of time. So we have history. We, you can look back in the past and show that, that consumer side resources, and these are resources that came all the way from individual consumer air conditioners in New Jersey to large aluminum plants in Indiana uh, that really participated in the market on a, a regular basis and participated in a way that, and one thing I hope we talk about uh, is culture, the culture of, of the, of the uh, ISOs and the culture of the utilities and the distribution systems as well, understanding that these consumer resources can in fact be a real reliable resource that can provide real services into the market. So it's been done, there, there's history, there's an example, so let's talk a little bit about the future and wrapping up my, my, my five minute introduction here. I think the future really is at the area of the distribution utility and really what, what Ron is running and what really we need to look at of how we ultimately can optimize those distribution resources for the distribution system as well as the large bulk power system. And that is something we haven't done yet effectively. Uh, my, my company, Solar City, is participating in a um, pilot with PG&E of 150 homes in the San Jose area where we're going to be putting in not only solar PV but also uh, storage and integrated uh, advanced inverters and uh, software and controls that ultimately can be used by the distribution utility to aggregate those systems and then bid them up into uh, the ISO and do it in a, in a way that uh, the resources can be dispatched and used for the various uh, energy resource services that the ISO needs on a day-to-day -day basis. But I, you know, New York is, is working on this, California is working on this, and, and uh, talk about the, the past, I do have to say, you know, Audrey Zibelman in New York, New York, who's the president of the New York Commission, well, she ran PGM at one time. So she understands and knows, you know, the history of what, was, what went on in PGM with respect to demand response, and I think she's carrying it on to what she's doing 
in, uh, in, in New York. And I want to give you know, President Picker uh, a lot of uh, credit as well for uh, how he's leading the, the California uh, Commission here uh, and collaborating, coordinating with the ISO. And that's really what we have to do. We have to have that state federal collaboration coordination that you saw from, the, from our first panel if we're really going to get to the future. Thank you. So a lot of really difficult key themes, visibility, flexibility, architecture, grid architecture, regulation, operations, uh, culture of the ISO. So we have a lot of things to dig into here. Um, Luigi, let's start with, with Italy. And between Turna, the transmission system operator, and NL, the national power company, the, that essentially uh, you set up NL Distribuzioni the, as a DSO. How do you communicate? What kind of visibility does Turna as TSO have into the distribution system operations in Italy? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, David. This is a crucial key question because, uh, um, as I was saying before, uh, la la last, time, last time when I came here, I said, okay, we have a toolbox exactly same, similar to the toolkit uh, Lorraine was mentioning before, a toolbox full of uh, resources, the reactors, condensers, reinforcements of the grid, uh, storage, and uh, all, uh, all these tools uh, addressed to manage the uh, RES in the in DER. But this is not enough. Uh, this is not enough. We have to proactively address the uh, DER uh, via a, a good, robust, and new relationship with the distributor. And this is key because we do not forget the second pillar uh, I have to mention here, that is to say, the, we have, even in this evolving context, we have to uh, ensure quality, adequacy, and security of the system, which is a tough task. Uh, absolutely, in this uh, continuously evolving, evolving contest, and with different, let me say like that, roles and responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the distribu our distribution colleague. So we are responsible for the quality and the adequacy of the grid. We are responsible for the balancing of the grid, um, but they are the ones uh, the uh, DER are connected to. So how to manage the, the, this um, relationship, which is not a conflict eff effectively, but requires a long path to be paced again. We have, um, we start uh, last year uh, in um, connecting our association of TSO in Europe and so, and the other association of distributors and with uh, significant working group and have here one, the first report issued uh, one month ago. It's available, it's public, and for those of you who are, uh, can be interested in, uh, in seeing what's going on in this kind of relationship, uh, it's available and can be easily distributed, at least as PDF. And uh, this report, uh, unfortunately, uh, does not fix all things. Uh, this is the point. Eh? They, they, they started in very good, uh, uh, in a very good way. They starting with let's first uh, agree about terminology. Okay, let's talk the same language first. Okay, it's an, it, it, fine, but it's not enough. Then let's talk about the data needed to be uh, exchanged. And I recall the interface of Lorenzo. Uh, that crucial. This is crucial. The data interface. Because the, 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 the position, usually the position of distributor is like that. Okay, DR is our problem. Uh, stay there. I'll keep you informed about what's going on in the system. It's, this is not acceptable because we are talking about the real time phenomena first. And secondly, we, what we would like, we want, let me say better, we want to unlock the potential of the ER. It's not just a question of dealing with them, for the, the, which is the, the issue of last year. The new issue, the new challenge is we would like to unleash their potential. And this is the new challenge for the future. And uh, that's why we are talking about the DSR. Unfortunately, in Italy, we are not uh, well ahead of time. France, Germany uh, have much better introduced and advanced and progressed the system of demand-side response. We are working, we are trying to catch up with them, and, but we deem, as Italians, we deem 
uh, that the, uh, the, the man-side response can play a significant, robust role in providing and delivering ancillary services. That's exactly what we need. So it's the DER itself that can manage it uh, via these ancillary services, the need of, of flex and provide the need of flexibility the, the, and, and whatever we would like to do. So we, which is the right point, and then I leave the word to, to, to the others. The, the, we, uh, we have focused that a central key point is to establish and build a central hub. So whatever, whatever is the responsibility of the metering, metering is crucial. We have to gauge everything. We, can, we have to uh, make the DER visible even to the upper levels. And we have, to, doing that, we have, and in order to do that, we have to put in place a central hub. A central hub managed by a neutral party, a third party, I would say, which is another good recommendation of this book, of this report, and, in, and, the, and the TSO can uh, um, have the access to, to, the, to this central hub in order to uh, get the grid operation data and the commercial data as well. Because in our I mean, context, I'm talking about Italian one, it's us who are responsible uh, as well about the settlement of all the commercial operations. So we, have, we must have a complete visibility of what's going on, not only on the operation grid side, but also on the commercial side, in order to settle all the imbalances of the, of, of the system. So uh, in order to, and, and quickly concluding, in order to react to the uh, David Olson's que question, we have not the recipe already on the table. We are working hard to get it. We think that, and we do not, unfortunately, we do not see eye to eye with the distributor. Uh, I, 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 we, we, I can't say we, we are at odds with them, but we have different views. Uh, balancing is an, an our, our task. We have a responsibility for, the, for that. We have, in since we have a concession, we have to uh, guarantee a complete, robust, and uh, real-time balancing. But we can, uh, uh, in a positive way, leverage on their support. Does Hawaii rely on DER to provide ancillary services and, and have operations had to change? How yeah, how let, let, me, let, me, uh, let me address this and, and let me qualify this. Just uh, I should have put this in, into my introductory remarks. Um, as all of you know, we don't have FERC jurisdiction in Hawaii. We don't have NERC jurisdiction. We don't have an ISO or RTO. Actually, we, everything of, of that nature is within the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission's jurisdiction. We were given the authority by the legislature through the Hawaii Electric Reliability Authority uh, legislation, which was to create a framework for uh, uh, an ISO like structure, uh, 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 a monitor, uh, you know, to level the playing field to make sure interconnection and, and those things were, uh, were, were being overseen in a fair way and a, a fair level playing field. And then as you uh, know, uh, we primarily are consisted of uh, the Wine Electric Companies, which is a in vertically integrated um, investor owned utility, but they are in generation transmission and distribution as well. Um, and we have one rural cooperative, which again is into generation transmission and distribution, and we do regulate that rural cooperative. That being said, uh, and I also have to qualify because Ron reminded me, this is like the, the qualifier remarks, so, because we are live streaming here and I don't want to run afoul of, uh, of any prohibitions on open dockets. We do have open dockets on all these matters, our power supply improvement docket, our DER docket, our demand response docket, and so these things are all being looked at um, as we speak, but I will try to be as specific as I can uh, as those questions are, are asked of me. And to say yes, that we have in fact by guidance and orders directed the utilities, and that is the investor-owned utility as well as the rural cooperative, to, uh, to integrate DERs into the system operations, and that requires a lot of grid modernization and some infrastructure improvements. But it also is not just on the utility side, as, as John alluded to, it is on the customer side. And it is really leveraging those resources in a balanced portfolio of central plant resources as we move from a central plant radio system to a more distributed system of what we call, I think, Amory Levin's uh, 
I first gave the concept, virtual power plants, where customers distributed generation. And it's twofold because distributed generation right now is primarily in intermittent renewables, solar, rooftop PV, and we have the highest penetration of rooftop solar in the country in Hawaii by virtue because of various factors like the electric prices and, and the availability of these technologies, um, you know, in our, in our, uh, in our grids and, and the choices they were enabled to, uh, the customers to have to lower and manage their, their electric bills. But because the technology has advanced so quickly, we are now able to harness, especially in the more, uh, the, the more recent iterations of, of distributed generation, the two-way inverters, much like what uh, Germany did. So to address the overgeneration from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. in our jurisdiction, when there's a lot of, of renewable energy on the grid, but not enough load uh, to balance that out. And again, we don't have an energy imbalance market. Everything must be balanced. Uh, you you know, within the day, uh, during the peak and during the non-peak and during the midday in that island grid. So a lot of challenges, but a lot of opportunities because what we have to do and what we have done from our side as the regulators is to identify what, need to be, what needs to be done from a regulatory perspective. Time of use rates are important and we are in the midst of, uh, we're, uh, Hopefully we'll be issuing our time of use rates order shortly, but time of use rates help to, it's a blunt instrument, but to shift load to the times of day when we have a, an oversupply of renewables or an oversupply of distributed generation. And the distributed energy resources that I mentioned, energy efficiency and demand response are clearly tools that help us as well do that with, along with the time of use rates. Dynamic pricing is important in this mix of allowing DERs to participate and unbundling the services so that on the bill, like you would on your cell phone bill, you see exactly the value of what energy you are giving to the grid, whether, you know, in terms of a distributed generation, whether it's our grid supply, because we did revise the net energy metering structure. We have a grid supply track. Now we have a customer supply and a customer supply plus storage track to give customers options to still have um, distributed generation, but also DERs in terms of storage that can provide ancillary services and thereby, uh, if customers choose those options, they'll, they'll have a preference in terms of interconnection to the grid. Uh, this was a DER docket uh, order that we issued back in October 12th of 2015 to address the, the issues of, of, of the NEM uh, uh, tariff needing to be changed. And we still have a grid supply tariff, which uh, gets compensated at the wholesale rate, um, which is what the rural cooperative it was a uh KIUC was already doing from years ago, their Schedule Q was at compensating NEM customers at the, at the, at the wholesale rate. Um, but we are moving forward now with this, and, and as I said, going back to unbundling of, of, of services and prices so people can clearly see, again, I'm trying to address all the factors of transparency, visibility, flexibility here uh, in, in one fell comment, uh, so perhaps I won't have to be revisited uh, you know, on the panel, but while, I'm, while I've got the mic, let me just cover this because I think it's a more cohesive conversation and the, the, you know, the audience here can better understand. The ancillary services have to be valued. And therefore, the last piece of this really is, is the demand response tariffs. And that has to be a lot more laser, a lot more surgical, a lot more specific because we're valuing the ancillary services that the DERs are bringing. And whether, you know, and that's not just peak load shifting now. It is actual services to support the grid in terms of capacity, which is what the transmission system here needs. And, and you know, we have the fortune of not having a separate bureaucracy and structure, so we can integrate this a lot quickly, a lot more quickly. But it's the same things that people are addressing here in, 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 in you know, an ISL RTO kind of environment with distribution, uh, you know, and, and a wholesale market. Uh, so basically, we are trying to make sure that we value those services because energy storage and some of the DER, I mean, this, the inverter themselves provide reactive power and the distribution technology the many vendors that you see here at this at this conference are providing the tools so we have the distribution technology we have the software control technology now that be able to capture the data analytics the big data analytics that can help utilities in big jurisdictions like California really use these tools uh, effectively but from the regulatory perspective we must we must make sure there's certainty as to how these services fit in 
the pricing for that. And that's why the demand response tariffs are very important to, to value those ancillary services so that the utilities, whether it's the system operators, um, transmission system operators, or at the distribution level, can incentivize the right customer choices and customers as well can be active partners, stay connected to the grid, large customers, residential customers, stay connected to the grid and provide ancillary services. So where they provide ancillary services to the, to the grid, the, the, you know, they will receive credits for that and to the extent they receive services from the grid because no matter what you say, the distributed generation out there still needs the, the grid to to uh, you know, provide energy to the customer. So valuing both the energy they give to the grid and the grid services they take. And that's really how we're trying to actually implement this in a real world way. It's not just theoretical, but working out the nuts and the bolts. And we've done this in the technical working groups, the stakeholder process. It's not always easy, it's not fast, but that's important. And we come from an island culture. We all row in the canoe together. So therefore the dialogue has to be robust. We have to have good input from all the stakeholders and the utilities and the customers so that we can move forward and have, uh, you know, input and then ultimately we do make the decision as a PUC but hopefully the process has been a collaborative one that includes all inputs and, and addresses the concerns. It, it's clear we're going to have to schedule a field trip to Hawaii. Uh, Just, of course. John. Yeah. <laughs> and if I could follow up on what Lorraine was saying because it, it's extremely important what she said especially the aspect of valuing these resources and let me give you again take you back to the past and give you an example from the past and from my, my FERC experience with respect to valuing distributed resources as an ancillary service resource in the grid. We recognized that the ancillary service of regulation service, which is a service that's necessary to, in essence, keep the grid in balance minute by minute, historically was provided by combustion turbines, where you run these things up and down and they respond within a minute or two or three minutes to a signal from the grid operator, from the ISO, that they need you know, more uh, reg up or reg down as, as loads are changing constantly in the grid like this. And so there's a price for that, a market price that's paid for that. Well, we had a company come to us at FERC who told us, well, you know, we have this thing called a flywheel that we ultimately can put into the grid, and we can provide this ancillary service of regulation service, but we can provide it much, much quicker than a combustion turbine. In fact, we can provide it like that as soon as we get the signal. We can provide it, in essence, in milliseconds, back and forth, up and down, reg up, reg down. And it turns out there's a few other things that can do that as well. Batteries can do that as well. You can, in essence, also turn a load off or on, you can't, you can't inject into the grid like you can with a battery or inject into the grid like you can with a flywheel, but you could turn a load off or on to provide one level of, of regulation service as well. But we recognized that that kind of service, because when you've got, you're trying to follow the load with, say, a combustion turbine, and the load's going up like that, and then the combustion turbine comes behind it like this, it's not following that load precisely, but if you do it with something like a battery or a flywheel, you're following that curve precisely. So you don't have to, in essence, travel as far, ultimately, to catch that load and make sure that you're in balance. So you're providing a higher quality, and in fact, a more valuable service. And so as a result, FERC put in place a rule, Order 755, that says that ultimately if you can provide regulation service at a higher quality, then you get paid more. And now this is a rule that is being implemented across the country, but it's really important to ensure that we get the prices right, because if we don't get the prices right and the, and the compensation right for these distributed resources, we're not going to encourage the competitive entrepreneurs to come in and assist consumers with providing these services on the other side of the meter. We really do have to get the prices right. It really is essential. Get prices right not only for services that can be provided 
up at the uh, transmission uh, ISO level, but services that can be provided down into the distribution level as well. So Lorraine was talking about, you know, ultimately uh, there's voltage VAR support that can be provided, and other things can be, can be provided by these advanced inverters, and I can, you know, give Hawaii and California credit for requiring now advanced inverters have to be put in with these uh, PV systems, because it, it provides another level of services that can be provided to the grid, but we need to price them properly and ensure that we're not getting duplicate services where a distribution utility is putting them on their side of the meter and a customer has them on, on the other side of the meter and, you know, we're building two systems. We've got to make sure that we've got a market set up even down at the distribution level that ultimately can provide for the payment of those services by whomever can provide them at the market price. Terrific. To to wrap up, we're going to have to wrap up here, but I'd like to, in doing so, I'd like to tie the discussion uh, today uh, back to all our consideration of regionalization yesterday, the first day of the symposium. Um, and I'd like to ask Lorenzo, does the expansion of distributed energy resources conflict with regionalization, or are regionalization and decentralization complementary? It's very much the latter. I, I think uh, this is probably not well understood because there's been a lot of focus on regionalization, especially uh, in the political realm. But what we're seeing really is with the overarching goal of cleaner energy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, more renewable energy supply, there are really two paths to getting where, there that are both part of the story. There's regionalization and there's decentralization. And we haven't used that word decentralization yet, but when we talk about the expansion of distributed resources, it really brings up the capability of thinking in a more decentralized sense about the capabilities, the uses of electric power, the ways that it ties into other resources. And so decentralization, and I was at the uh, IEEE uh, Smart Grid conference yesterday, and it's so prevalent throughout the industry that you talk about the regulators and the big utilities and the generating companies and all the innovative technology companies, and then you go down to the individual customer. There's an intermediate layer up from the individual customer, which is at the level of local governments, cities and counties, all of which have climate action plans. And for them, distributed resources are a way of achieving greater local resiliency, achieving their climate action plans. And as we do more of this decentralization, it reduces congestion on the grid. It increases the capacity utilization of the high voltage grid. It doesn't undermine the need for regionalization or the benefits of accessing wind from Wyoming and solar power from New Mexico and wherever, all of these things are really complementary paths where that local system now connects to the grid, buys and sells in the wholesale market, but it's the complementarity of these two themes that really create the future that we're working towards. So to be continued, please help me uh, thank the panel.